Neil Peart of Rush is with us tonight. He's the author of a new book, The Masked Rider. Now you are, as you were just describing, getting ready to launch another tour. And you have gone out to take drum lessons? Well, it actually started about two years ago, actually yeah. exactly two years ago now. That uh, It happened through the process when I made the Buddy Rich tribute. And I, w I was able to work with about 20 of the finest drummers in the world on that. But one of them, Steve Smith, I'd known for quite a few years. And uh, I suddenly saw an incredible growth in his playing musically. Not in technique or yeah. paradiddles or anything like that, but just a beautiful musical gift to the music he was playing. And I asked him his secret. And his one-word answer was Freddy. So I, th I was thinking, well, I've been playing for 30-odd years, and there are certain things that I don't know how to do and would like to, and, and so on. So I thought I'd try it. And I spent a couple of weeks in New York studying with this teacher. It's a 70-year-old man who grew up in New York of the 40s, of, the, of course, the magic jazz era, yeah. of all the speakeasies and after-hour clubs, and, and a very burgeoning, very vital music scene at the time. And then found his vocation in teaching, and for the last 40 years has devoted himself to teaching, such that and his students have been with him always for years because he's more like what a tennis coach would do. He doesn't teach you notes or beats. He brings it out. He of watches you move yeah. and tells you how you might move better. He, it is about that. It's, it's like about physical grace. And uh, the first couple of lessons, he would stand in front of me and do a soft shoe dance and say, "Look, where's this happening? In the air." And piano, does it happen on the table? No, it happens in the air. Violin, it's the bowie, it happens in the air. Why not worry about what happens in the air? I mean, hitting the drum, that hit is a tiny little part of that motion. Yeah. And same with your feet and your whole body. So he got me thinking in terms of that integrated circularity, getting all everything moving smoothly into another. And it worked so well, and it gave me an element that I've been looking for, fluidity in my playing. There's also a lot that goes up in the air out of your hand. The sticks. I oh, yeah, you know? just one of my risk factors, yeah. What, you like to keep yourself on the edge? Right? Yeah, so I toss a stick up in the air, you can never be sure you'll catch it, so I like that. And you don't lose your focus, you're not worried about trying to catch it I as I choose a place to... where it won't. You know, I don't <laughs> want to affect the music, obviously, so I choose a place where if I miss it, I'll have time to grab another one. That's... Now, you, we talked about this in, in one of the breaks, uh, this notion of the three of you, of a trio. Your family is a group of three. Mm -hmm. uh, Rush, I mean, 22 years, this group of three. Is there a special dynamic there? That I certainly feel that there is, and all of my earlier groups were five-member groups, four-member groups, which obviously didn't survive. But, <laughs> but apart from that, they would tend to factionalize. And if it was a group of four or a group of five, they would split up into three guys against two. Or, you yeah. know, it would always be this division, where in, in three, it's very hard to do that. If it's two on one, then it's likely the third is going to get kicked out and there'll be someone else. But uh, it just seems it's limited enough that you can for instance, have a completely collaborative relationship where we do. There's no one songwriter, so there's no jealousy. There's no envy factor of, you, you write all the songs, I want to write some songs, mm -hmm. which tears a lot of groups apart. Yeah. You'd be very surprised how envy is a, is a motor of destruction in that respect. Mm -hmm. So in our case, it doesn't happen. The other two collaborate on the music, and, and I contribute the lyrics, so all of us feels equally involved. We all co-produce each other. You know, I judge Getty's bass parts, he judges my drum parts, and it's just a beautiful... And how do you resolve a fight if you get mad at one of the two? Have you learned? Have you found ways? Yes, we, we, uh, same as in any relationship. You have to ask yourself in your own mind, is this worth breaking up over? Is this worth the band breaking up? I'm really mad. Should I go start this fight or should I just shut up and resolve it or try to, try to discuss it in a more dignified way? So we've learned over the years that when we criticize, we criticize with dignity and with respect. So that if, if I don't like, like the other two guys play a piece of music for me and I don't really understand where it's coming from, I don't say, that's garbage. What are you guys, crazy? You know, yeah. you say, well, you know, I see what you're trying to get, but I don't quite see the, what the missing link. So you try to constructively help. And with lyrics, the same way. If the guys don't understand what I'm trying to say, then I know I have a problem. I have a problem. As Is a it easier to do that when you're famous or harder? Probably harder. I, again, in the envy factor, and the people get stuffed up with self-importance, and they, how dare you criticize my work? And I know, I, I know, a lot of people are that way. That everything they do is great, and and that's the end. Obviously, when you get to that stage, and a friend of mine, Ben Minkoff, and said they need an insultant, someone just to say, look, everything you do is not great. <laughs> we'll take a short break. Come back with some final thoughts from Neil Peart tonight. Fair Verona, where we lay our scene. Two households, both alike in dignity. Throw your mistempered weapon to the ground! From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. Who is it that you love? Gentle Romeo, if thou dost love, pronounce faithfully. My heart's dear love is set. 
on the fair daughter of rich Capulet. Hey, My only love sprang from my only hate. Romeo is Venice! Maybe they will murder me. Let them find me here. A plague! I found you a house! DiCaprio, Claire Danes, in William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. Playing this month on Direct Ticket, only on Direct TV. Neil Peart is our guest tonight, the drummer with Rush, the author of a new book, The Masked Rider. Two questions about, I guess, religion and spirituality. When you were a kid at 15, you wrote, God is dead on the ceiling of your bedroom. <laughs> and your parents convinced you otherwise. Well, no, they were, they were just kind of appalled by, you know, I had a very religious grandmother, and what, what if, you know, her reaction was, is not to be imagined. And, and it, was, <laughs> it was strictly ambivalence on my part. I didn't know any better. I didn't really care. And it was, I had no idea that I was preaching Nietzsche. But, uh, <laughs> and, and when the objection was brought up, I just took the spray can, which we had in those days, yeah. and changed it to God isn't dead. And I was just as happy with that. I, I was, mainly, the main issue to me, I was, I was allowed to spray paint graffiti on my bedroom ceiling. <laughs> I mean, that was the, the essence of freedom and self-expression. At that what age. What I was saying at that age, I, I didn't know or care any better, so it just didn't matter. I mean, you've also, in your time, been very powerfully affected by, by nuns, by, by religious <laughs> music. <laughs> Young Catholic school students often say that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there was an uh, there was an episode that recounted in the book yeah. about uh, staying at a monastery in Cameroon, and this was run by a Swiss uh, church, French-speaking nuns, and they invited us as their guests to attend the vespers service. And I've always been in love with the sound of vespers, you know, and an mm -hmm. evening service sounded really beautiful to me, a very romantic I notion. So certainly I, I wasn't going to miss it. And I went to hear it, and it was a gorgeous thing in, in the this echoing church, the voices of the nuns, and it was a mixture of Europeans and, and young African and novitiates or, or whatever they're called, you know, the, the sisters in study. Yes. And uh, there was one, the priest sat back a few rows and his bass voice filled them out, and one of the African sisters played guitar. And it was so glorious musically. And they were singing a psalm, ironically, 102. I looked up later, which was a cry for help in the wilderness, which in the middle of a trip through Cameroon was not a bad bit of irony either. But the simple sound <laughs> of the voices and the music moved me really profoundly and uh, just dredged up a lot of these thoughts about what religion had been to me, questioning as a youth, you know, 13, wondering, mm -hmm. sitting at Sunday school, singing, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam and all that, and really wondering, <laughs> what, really, you know, is this true? And, and I wasn't a doubter, I was just, I guess I always say, no, I'm not a cynic, I'm a skeptic. I was just like, yeah. really? And that's the always my response. The literal translation of yeah. some of these things. Yeah. It matters, the difference matters to me, that I'm not a cynic in the sense I don't put things down before I understand them, but I'm skeptical that I won't embrace them before I understand them either, is how I perceive Has it. that profoundly influenced the way you write? I hope so. You know, I really want to have that balance where I don't embrace anything automatically and I'll carefully investigate and try to understand it, what would make a person behave this way, what would make a group of people act this way, what makes religion possible, what makes politics possible. These are all enduring questions that are great fun to sit. When you're sitting on a bicycle for 10 hours a day, mm -hmm. these are the luxuries that you have. And, and part of your profession, too, is being a songwriter. If you're sitting uh, looking out the window, you can call it work. And it's one of the aspects of being a writer I really like is reflection is part of the job. You know, it's not a luxury. For most people, it is a luxury. And it's what poets and songwriters and playwrights and authors Ought to do for us. You do a lot of your work and your preparation by yourself. Like you rehearse without the group. Yeah, uh, that's just because I, I want to be good already before I get there, and I'll, I'll try to start writing lyrics before we get together because I want to have something to present. It's to me a part of professionalism that when the band starts rehearsing, I should be ready. So I'll I'll start two weeks before. Now I practice every day anyway, but in, in previous years, if a tour was coming up or before we go into the studio, I, I just love to be prepared. I love to practice. It doesn't bother me a bit to spend two weeks playing songs over and over again. It's, it's my job. And, and I have to like that part of it a lot. And if I don't have an audience there, it doesn't detract from me. It's still the challenge of performing it well and, and trying new things and making it fresh and making it good. It, it's, it's endlessly rewarding. In, in five seconds or less, we're almost out of time. Do you, do you still love the road life or do you resist it? I resist it, but uh, there are elements of it that I do like. Traveling around is nice. Um, art galleries around the world are nice. And 
and playing the music is nice. It's really lovely to meet you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank for you. being with us tonight. Neil Peart, and I've said it right all night. Every night. Uh, Neil Every Peart, time. the new Rush album is Test for Echo, and his new book about cycling, literally on a bicycle through West Africa, The Mass Rider, is just about to hit the stands. And we didn't even talk about your motorcycle days. I gather <laughs> you've progressed on now to the motorcycle. Just trying different modes of transport. <laughs> Next Wednesday, Pamela.